I just want to say hello and welcome to everyone that's uh, in attendance. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be doing a couple of different recipes, which uh, one of them is kind of a standard green goddess dressing uh, is kind of something that has been in the arsenal here in Sonoma County for many chefs for many years and kind of as a standard, not just salad dressing, but for crudite as a dipping dressing for all kinds of veggies and a side as we we're going to show you for fishes as well. Uh, and then one of our local favorites, salmon, and I believe Justin might have some wild salmon this afternoon. Uh, today, we are really lucky. We've got a brand new Chardonnay that we're going to be trying. Uh, today is the Sable Ridge Chardonnay from the Jackson Estates series of wines. Uh, Sable Ridge is... Um, it's a project that's been online for us for a few years now. Actually, it's one of the properties, one of the first properties that Jess and Barbara bought uh, together just shortly after they were married. Uh, it's, a pair, it's a property that's high up in elevation in Anderson Valley. It's at about uh, 1,500 to maybe almost 1,800, 2,000 feet, I believe, in elevation. And if you were in the town of Boonville and looking to the east, it would be up in the top mountain ridges around that area. Uh, and it's a very unique growing region. Um, with it being in elevation, you know, we've got uh, cooler days and hotter evenings. Uh, which is kind of the reverse of what they have at the valley floor in Boonville. So a lot of sunlight up there, a lot of development of skin, and it gives us a lot of body and some texture and some depth to the wine. But the cool climate keeps it from becoming too juicy and too round. Um, if you notice as you're smelling the wine, you definitely get some fruit, but it's not too over the top. It looks like Justin's here. Here we are. Boom. Before we go, because we have the wine to talk about, we got to let Justin start getting into his show. But uh, Justin, do you have a glass to hold up and say cheers with? Cheers. There we are. Nice. Um, well, what's that for? Table in the glass. Yes, it is. I got some uh, beautiful salmon in here. So this is uh, came in today. Let's see if we can see that. So one of the things you're looking for when you're looking at a piece of fish is you want to see that the eyes are really clear. See, <laughs> see that? Uh, the eyes look really clear. There's, the skin's really shiny. You want to give it a touch. It shouldn't be soft to the touch. It should be really firm. And the main thing um, you really want is you don't want it to smell like seafood. It should smell really clean like the ocean. So when you're, when you're shopping for fish, you know, go to a reputable spot or, you know, you can buy it straight from the fisherman. Um, this is a wild king salmon came off the coast here in Northern California. And this one is about 10 pounds, so it's probably a two-year-old fish. And it was probably born in the Sacramento River, swam out to the ocean, swam around for two years, and then it was caught on a hook, hook and line. Um, so it's a sustainable fish. And if we hadn't have caught it, it probably would have hung around for about two more years and then going back to the Sacramento River to spawn. So um, the salmon season is right now, but they are going about three weeks on and then one week off basically uh, to help sustain the amount of fish. And uh, it's also determined by weather. When it gets really windy, it's dangerous to fish out there. So um, it kind of goes up and down this time of year. But when you get a good one, it's a beautiful, beautiful fish. I really like it with Chardonnay. Um, if I'm steering it or cooking it in the oven, if I'm going to throw it on the grill and you get a little smoke, you can go either Chardonnay or Pinot. So it can stand up to a red wine as well, a lighter red wine. It's a really heavy, fatty, uh, fatty fish. So I'm going to show you how to break it down, then we're going to cook it up a couple different ways, and then we're going to make some green goddess sauce. So, hey, Justin, while you're uh, walking around to go prep that, you mentioned uh, kind of how firm the fish is. And a lot of times chefs will use kind of like the, the space between their thumb and their fingers. If you press on that as maybe what firm might be or kind of a space on their hand. Is there a, like is there something that you might go by to give people an idea of what you're referring to as far as that might be? Yeah, I mean, it definitely feels like a medium. You don't want it to feel like a rare steak. You don't want it to be soft. Like, this definitely has some push back to it. It's a nice, firm fish. And sometimes when you get him in, we used to have this guy, Wild Bill, who would bring us fish straight from the ocean. 
and they would be so fresh that they'd still be in rigor, and they would literally stand off the board with the head and tail. And then when they're that fresh, you don't want to butcher them that day. You want to let them relax and butcher them the next day because you'll kind of tear it up. So um, you want it to be fresh, but if it's straight out of the water, then let it sit overnight if you can. You know, I just so want to there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Uh, the way I usually start, I like to have a long knife. This is a bevel knife. Tracy in the back, my class. Um, hey, I, Justin, before you get going, I just wanted to mention to everyone, um, you know, we have the chat side for anyone who wants to talk and say hello to one another. But if you have questions as Justin's going through these steps, we have a Q&A section and um, we're, oh, we have a question or something that says we're getting a lot of echo from Justin. So maybe, uh, I don't know what we can do if Tommy's over there helping you, we can work on a little bit of that, but thank you for that response. But I just wanna let people know that we, um, we do have a question and answer section. So if you have questions for Justin as we're moving along, I'll try to help facilitate that and then uh, make sure that you do ask and then we'll answer some questions afterwards um, to put everything in perspective if you guys have questions once we're done. All right. Pedro, you said you have a lot of echo. You, now that you're a little closer, it's not so much. So, um, you know, maybe we, it, I think it might be just a matter of you being a little, a couple of feet away from where the, uh, the mic is on the computer, potentially. Okay. Um, so, Basically, I'm going to start with a sharp, long, beveled knife, and I'm going to come in behind my collarbone on the salmon. Can you hear me better? I can hear you pretty well. Uh, maybe we could bring the, the computer. Maybe Tommy can lower it a little bit and bring it a little bit closer, and that might help out. I don't know. Do you want me to just pick it up? Yeah, maybe just pick it up. Just hold it. Sorry about that, guys. So but okay. what Justin's saying, he's talking about coming in right behind that, uh, what they call the collarbone, or, or right in there to kind of take off where the head is coming in. So as you can see, he's kind of making that initial slice there and, and getting into that action. So what would you call that again? I'm sorry, Justin. Uh, the collarbone, I'm just coming back towards me. And basically, I'm just going to run along the backbone here. And, and you want to stay kind of on the back bend to where you can feel it, and you'll kind of be breaking the little bones in there. So, I don't know, Tommy, can you get down? Boy, that's a really beautiful fish. You can really see that that color. It's super fresh, and it's got quite a good quite a good fat ratio going on inside there as well. I'd say, yeah, Justin. So the color of salmon is from what it eats, it's from its diet. So it eats these krill, and you can see this one's beautiful deep red color. So it's been eating well. And so you can see I just came down along that backbone there. And then you can do a couple different things. So there's a little bit of meat on here. And what I can do is I can take a spoon and I can scrape it. and get that meat off. So the other thing I could do is I could cut it and smoke it, which is what we do a lot of times. This is nice for if you wanna make like a spicy tuna roll. If it's a wild fish out of the ocean, um, it's safe to eat raw. If it's a farm raised fish, you probably don't wanna eat it raw without freezing it. And the other thing is, um, you want to eat it obviously fresh and make sure it's fresh. Well, a lot of times for fun, we'll do like hand rolls, like a spicy salmon hand roll or some um, salmon crudo or uh, tartare. So you just scrape that part you missed off there a little bit so you're not wasting anything. I'm just going to flip it over to the other side. And you, want to, you don't want to move it around too much because you could actually kind of break up the meat, separate the meat. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here. Again, I'm just going to follow that back bend down. Trying to keep as much meat as possible. Let's see. And then so the 
just a lot of a lot of feel going on with that with when you're kind of cutting that away you're you really want to feel the bumps so i'm when i have the knife i'm kind of just like that and i kind of keep it at a little angle and just slide down the bone so the other side i scraped this side i could cut out and sprinkle with salt and sugar and then just smoke it for a couple minutes and then you can get that beautiful nice smoked meat there you can also pull the cheeks out. Some people like to eat the cheeks. Some people like to roast the collar uh, or grill it or smoke it. But you can see that's pretty good. I guess it didn't leave too much meat on there. From there, let's clean up the board a little bit and come back through here. Usually what I do is I take this nice belly piece off here at the bottom because it's really nice and fatty, but it's going to be a little bit thinner than the rest of the salmon. So it's probably going to cook if you cook it on a whole piece. So again, on this one, we'd probably do like 50% salt, 50% white sugar, and let it sit for at least two hours maybe, and then put it out in the smoker and then pick that nice meat out of there. You know, you can also eat that raw for a piece of sushi. Nice and fatty, definitely nice with the Chardonnay there. And then now I'm gonna kind of come here and pull this bottom set of bones out. And I'm just running the knife right along those bones right there. And then pull this back thin off. This one. And again, just trying to keep the knife right against the bone. Just a couple right up there. This is where you could really have a lot of losses with what your either profit in a restaurant is or maybe what you might have paid for with what you bought, correct? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely, uh, it adds up quickly, you know, it's, uh, it's a, I think right now it's 15 bucks a pound, which is pretty high, um, but, you know, we don't lose too much. We probably lose 20 percent maybe on that. Um, but what we do is we portion it to sell as like a entree serving and then we smoke it for a salad or something like that. We actually have this on the menu right now. I'm going to show you how to smoke a piece later. Um, so the next step is to kind of pull the pin bones out and I find it's kind of easy to just run your knife across the top so you can feel them, they kind of pop up a little bit. And again, you want to be gentle, you don't want to beat the fish up. The fresher it is, the harder it is to pull those pin bones out. Um, and I find that, you know, nice spring-loaded plier, there's different kinds, there's like little fish pliers that, you know, shape like a fish or whatever. I like this one, um, it's more like a real plier. But then you just want to grab onto that pin bone and I kind of like to shake my hand a little bit to really get it out of there. And then I have a little thing of water here and I just drop that in there. So you don't want, the main thing you don't want is to get bones all over your board and make a mess. So you just want to kind of pull these out in the direction they're going and just go one by one down the line here. Sometimes you get a little piece of meat in the in the plier and you just have to pull it out. I've seen some folks like take a bowl and put it underneath it, but I feel like that kind of separates it. So if you need to lift it up a little bit to find those bones, just lift it up. But the more you really move the fish, um, the more it'll separate and then it doesn't look as good when you plate it up. I'm just popping those out. This is a wild king salmon, and this we bought from a company called Costarella Seafood. Um, they're from the Bay Area. They were, I don't know if you all heard about it, but they just had a really big fire down there. Um, they were fortunate because that was right near them, but they were not affected. But there were a lot of fishermen who lost equipment about two weeks ago in a huge uh, fire on the pier. But they've been in business for four generations. Uh, really nice people. They live up here in Petaluma and uh, gets us this beautiful fish. Um, 
six days a week. So it's nice. He even took a couple of our crew out um, salmon fishing last year, and they, they did pretty well. They got some better cap or pastry chef. His wife got a huge salmon, and Chef Paul caught a couple, and I think Buttercup got one, and maybe, it's, maybe one other fish. I can't remember what else they got, but they were out for salmon. We've got Bob potentially coming on very shortly, too. Oh, yeah, Bob might, Bob might pop on today. He was delivering uh, he was delivering seafood today. So if he finished his route, he might hop on the Zoom and let us know some salmon facts. Um, he also makes a really nice uh, smoked salmon that we use from time to time. Justin, we see a lot of chefs using those black gloves. Are those special gloves? Oh, and that's Bob's product. Yeah, the, the black gloves are nice um, because they are, uh, they're really easy to get on and off and they're not latex, so there's no allergies with these ones. Um, and they're pretty strong. So now I'm gonna show you um, our next steps, you know, depending on what we're doing. At this point, you could, if you were cooking for a lot of people, you could season this, rub it with a little olive oil, salt and pepper and ro roast this whole side in the oven. We actually have that recipe in the cookbook. Today, I'm going to portion a couple out, and we're going to cook it in a couple of different ways. So I'm going to do one in the oven. I think I'll probably sear one off, and then I'll smoke one. So over here, I got this cool little thing. It's called a Cameron's Smoker. My mom actually gave me this a long time ago. I probably had this since I was high school, probably. Um, but it's got, it's a stovetop smoker. It's not something you want to do in your house if you don't have a hood, but you can do pellets or wood chips. A lot of times we use ground barrels when we're smoking, but it's uh, super easy to use. Um, what I like to do is I like to burn the wood off a little bit because that first smoke that comes off uh, wood chips or wood when you first burn it, it's a really green smoke, which makes it a little bit bitter. So what I do is I usually start it, and then I get it going with a torch here. And get some of that initial smoke out. You know, you'll hear sometimes the barbecue people talk about blue smoke, and that's the, that gray blue smoke. Um, we watch when I close it, and when it first comes out, the first smoke's gonna be kind of so we'll let that burn for a minute and in the meantime we are going to portion the salmon a little bit here so a lot of times we're doing five ounce portions for a full size entree uh, but for tasting menus usually we're at two ounce portions so you can come across like this but i usually just split it right down the center because this side is going to cook evenly and this belly side to cook evenly um, for the for the smoking, I really like the belly side, and you know for grilling, searing. I mean, I think this is probably for me the better eating side. It's a little bit nicer, more moist. You can see that. I don't know if you can see that on camera well, but that, that smoke to me looks really really green right now. So we're just burning off those chips a little bit. <laughs> So now I'm going to pull the skin off one side here. Pull the skin off one side. So, what I like to do here, a lot of times if I'm doing a lot of fish, what I'll do is I'll get to this point and then I'll switch my cutting board out so I'm not getting those scales in there um, that are on the tray. So, it could be a good point in time to use a bench scraper, scrape your board off or get a new board if you're doing a bunch. Um, and then you never really want to take your knife on the cutting board and scrape it. You want to have, um, you want to use this because when you scrape your knife across the board, you're dulling your knife. Clean off my knife here. And then I'm just kind of grabbing the skin I'm just kind of pulling it back and forth, nice and easy, letting the knife do the work. And there's the skin. So you can also 
It's amazing when you see a chef do it and they make it look so easy, isn't it, everyone? All right. So now I'm gonna make a nice little portion there. Do a couple of those. Turn the smucker back on. I burned off that green smoke. I'll pop these in here. I got a little uh, salt. Recipe's also in the cookbook. Um, so I'll give it a little bit of uh, oil on here. You do olive oil or rice oil and a little bit of salt. We're just going to set it right on top of those lemons there. And then I got a little bit of fresh thyme put on here. I'm just going to pop that in um, this super simple way. I really like it. I got Chef Grace here. Just going to put it on the oven in the back. And then I got a cast iron pan. This is probably one of my go to pans at the house. Um, I'm the executive chef at the house, but I'm also the executive dishwasher. So this is a great pan to have because most of the time you just wipe it out with salt and you just season it and you're good to go. Turn that one on. And then do one more piece of this one. So I'm going to show you one piece with the skin on too, because some people like to eat their fish with the skin on. It makes a nice crunch on it. So I'll pull one of these portions off. Here. And I'm sorry, Justin, you broke up there really quick. Could you mention again about what size or what weight you're cutting these portions at, please? Um, so usually for an entree portion, we're like five ounces. These are probably about two or three. Um, this one, actually this is probably four, that's probably a two ounce portion there. For tasting menu or multiple courses, usually we're like two and a half ounces. On tray size, we're usually five. So one thing with, when you're cooking with the skin on, you wanna scrape your knife across it, make sure there's no scales on it. This is also gonna help you dry the fish out. Um, then it's good to take a, a towel or a paper towel dry it out. Season it with a little salt there. And then always heat your pan first and heat the oil. And once you see it start to smoke a little bit, you can pop your food in. This is a nice thing to have, a fish spatula here. Um, and when you put the, the fish down, especially when you have the skin on, it's a really good idea to hold it down because when you put a, a cold piece of food into a hot pan, it tends to curl up. So when you're cooking it with the skin on, you really want to hold it down because you want to get that skin crispy. So I can see my pan, the oil starting to move a little bit, kind of separating. I can see some smoke coming off there. So I'm going to drop that in there. I'm just going to press it down. I'll take my spatula, hold it down on there for like a minute. This one's a little bit thinner, so we're gonna leave that out for a sec. And you always wanna serve your presentation side to the side you see here first. So if you were gonna serve with the skin on, you wanna serve that side up. So you wanna start with that side in the pan. 
you gotta do when you put the stuff in the pan, you put it in the pan going away from you. So in case you splash oil, well, you don't splash it. Well. I'm gonna hold this one down a little bit. Basically, we're gonna try and get a nice crust on this too. And then we're gonna try and cook them to a nice medium rare. Um, I like the fish to, to be a little bit uh, rare on the inside. So. so I'm gonna get rid of this board and we're gonna make that sauce to go with it. We're gonna make a sauce called Green Goddess Sauce. It's a great sauce for uh, vegetables or fish or chicken. Or Just Justin, we had a real quick question. If I could, like, if I could butt in, uh, the fish that you put in with the lemons, with the onion in in the oven, did you oil yeah. those on both sides or just one side before you put them in, uh, or yeah. would you? Yes, you oil both rubbed, sides. Yeah, I just rubbed them with a little oil. You could do olive oil, or a lot of times when we're doing the seafood, we'll do a lemon oil, um, and then just sprinkle a little salt and pop it in the oven. And then you broke up there when you were saying keep the presentation side uh, side up first, correct? Yeah, whatever side you're serving, your presentation side, your top side, that's what you want to put in the pan first. So when you have a skin on fish, you want to put the skin down. I don't know if you can see the skin here, but it's getting nice. It's crispy. It's really delicious. It kind of tastes like a really good cracker when you cook it right. So you can see it's starting to turn golden brown. Because I held it down, there's no bubbles in it. So I'm gonna just put it back in the pan. I'm gonna lower the heat. On this other one, you can see it's getting a nice little crust on it. Um, this is my wife's favorite way to eat it. Nice and crispy on the top. I'll probably put that back on that side just for a minute in the pan. And then we're gonna make a sauce called uh, Green Goddess Sauce. And this is, uh, uh, mayonnaise-based sauce. It was really famous, probably late 70s, early 80s. It was invented in San Francisco at the Palace Hotel. And it's basically kind of like a mayonnaise-based sauce with a whole lot of fresh herbs in it. And it's really nice for dipping vegetables in. Really versatile sauce. Great. Uh, it's cold. It's nice for summertime, springtime. So back to this pan. I'm just going to season the second side now. And we're going to get these a little flipped. Hey, Justin, while you're doing that, what temp do you think that is that you've got that pan going at? What temperature? Temperature, uh, you know, on our gas stove, it's, uh, it's probably medium heat. Um, you know, it might be higher heat on a, on a home stove. And I've basically, that pan's so hot now, the fish is almost cooked. I actually turned it off. I'm just going to flip those over. That one got a little darker than I want, but the skin one's really nice here. Kind of golden brown. Uh, a little bit dark on that edge. I probably should have flipped it like a second before. Um, you know, some restaurants, fancy restaurants, they add a piece of butter and lemon and baste it with a spoon. Um, I don't know, put the skin on, I just like to leave it on them because I find when you baste the skin, you get, you get, it's crispy now, but then you end up sogging it out. So we're just gonna let those sit there. And the and the oven would be about what? You'd have the oven about 350? The oven uh, for this one, we're doing at like 275. And then in the smoker over here, and I got a little darker on it. Um, Just let it rest for a minute, but you basically want it still to be a little bit rare on the inside. So. Like that's kind of what you're going for on the inside right there. Both nice and smoky on that one. And then this is a good way, this is a hot smoke. You don't want to serve this one later. This is, if you're going to hot smoke something, you want to cook it and then eat it. If I let this cool down, it's just going to dry out. If we were going to um, smoke something we want to serve later, or cold smoke it, you know, like Bob's stuff here, I'm, I'm guessing he probably cold smokes this, um, probably cures it, maybe in a wet brine or a dry brine, and then uh, smokes it at a low temperature. 
this is a different style of smoking. Um, it just depends on what we're doing. Right now, this is on the tasting menu at KJ with the uh, Sable Chardonnay. And actually, another dish we did another class, the tortilla, uh, as well, is on that menu. So we just serve it with a little uh, preserved Meyer lemon, sour cream, and then the smoked fish. But we smoke it to order when we get a ticket. Justin, we had a good, we had a really good question, Justin. And the question was, would you use smoked salt on that? Or what type of salt would you use for finishing? And I think the question about smoked salt is very pertinent because to adding smoke to smoke, it can sometimes be a bit much. So could you address that, please? Yeah, um, we probably wouldn't use smoked salt on this just because we just smoked it. But we do use smoked salt from time to time. It's a really nice finishing salt. There's one called Malden and they make a smoked salt and that's really nice uh, if you want to just add some, you know, light smoke flavor to a dish. Um, we also just got one of those, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen them, one of those smoking guns where you can smoke something and put a lid over it and uh, take it to the table and then they lift it up and the, the smoke comes off. We haven't played around with it yet, but we got one of those and they're pretty cool. So that, that's a pretty nice piece of fish. It's still, I can feel on the side, it's still rare in the center, but that skin's really, really nice and crispy. And the thing about um, serving a fish with skin, it has to be crispy. Otherwise, it's really not good. It's a really bad texture. And then uh, hopefully Tracy's gonna check on those ones in the oven. Uh, we got another minute, how do they look? Okay. Um, so we're going to make this green goddess super simple, um, kind of whatever fresh herbs you got. This is more of the traditional flavors here. We're going to start off with a little bit of shallots and garlic. We're going to add some uh, chives, some tarragon, fresh parsley. All these herbs are from the garden. You should see it out there. It's absolutely beautiful this time of year. Some basil in there. And so this salad dressing was popular probably, I got some dill, probably in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I think there was like a Seven Sisters or Seven Islands brand. I remember when my grandma used to serve it. Um, but they had an outbreak of botulism and uh, you kind of kind of went away from the store shelves. And I think you see it again now, but it used to be a really popular sauce, and then it kind of just disappeared when I was in, you know, middle school, high school. I, you know, we didn't have green goddess for a long time. When I came to California when I moved back in 2000, I was working at this Culinary Institute of America, and they had green goddess on the menu. And um, this is my version of it. It's a little bit lighter. We had, uh, you can add yogurt or you can add sour cream. It's got quite so much mayonnaise, so we take a little bit of that mayonnaise out. You can put in there or not uh, anchovies. Um, I really like the flavor, and it's kind of a background flavor for uh, Caesar salad dressing. Um, so the anchovies add some saltiness and some of that umami. And then we like to add avocado to it as well. Um, so we're just going to pop this on here. I got some white verjou, and verjou is sour grape juice. We actually make one here. It's grapes that are harvested in July or August, and they're a little bit underripe, so it adds nice acid to the dish. Hey, Justin, are you rinsing those anchovies off before you put them in there, or you put them in there with all their olive oil and everything on them, the anchovies? Rinsed or not? Uh, yeah, you can put it on with the oil. You know, just whatever, whatever you add, it's just adding salt. So you can rinse your anchovies if you want it less salty or you can go ahead and add it in there and then just balance out with your salt. We're just gonna add a touch of black pepper, a little bit of salt in there. And I'm just gonna go ahead and get that blending and then we'll add our mayonnaise and avocado to that. So we'll just get this moving. And I got the avocado over here. Uh, 
So the avocado is like kind of the one thing no one's going to be able to uh, substitute, but are there other veggies or other little things that you may or may be able to substitute depending on where you live or seasonally across the States? Yeah, I mean, uh, the avocado would be a trick. I don't know what you'd substitute for that. Um, but yeah, you could do different herbs. You know, this is kind of a traditional flavor here um, of the herbs. But yeah, I don't know how you'd substitute for avocado. Um, a little bit of mayonnaise. And then we got some yogurt. You can do yogurt or sour cream. Pop that back on. Justin, while you're plating that, we had a great question about the salmon. And the, uh, the question was, what type of wood are you smoking it with? I know cedar, our cedar plank salmon is a very common thing in this area and kind of across the country. Uh, what are we using or what might be some, some suggestions you have? Yeah, I mean, I like that. In these things, it's, it's really nice to have the small powder. Um, that one got a lot darker than we'd normally smoke it there. Um, but the powder is nice. I like apple wood. It's not too bitter. But here we use a lot of, uh, we have a lot of oak barrels left over. So we'll take the, the barrel staves. And a couple times out of the year, we'll rent a wood chipper and we'll just push the barrel staves through the wood chipper and use that to smoke. Um, so, you know, that's a nice one. We're really good. Because oh, those barrels, once uh, once they've lived their life making wine at KJ, which is usually what about five years, maybe with three to five years, sometimes seven for certain wines. That's exactly right. And uh, some of our winemakers are going even a little bit further. Wow, that's got some beautiful color. We had a quick question. Did you put any green onion in that, Justin? Uh, I did not today. I forgot. But usually we do. I think that's in the recipe. I think there's a scallion and they use the, the tops of the scallion too. So um, you can definitely pop that in there. So I got this salmon from Tracy. This is out of the oven. And this is the one that was setting on top of the, the lemons. And you can see that was 12 minutes, 275 degrees. And when you break this open, you can see it's really, really nice and moist in there. This was that nice fatty side, and that texture is really, really great, really easy to eat. If you want a more crunchy piece, then, you know, definitely the skin's a nice way to go. But, you know, that's a key, just really having that salmon cooked. Because once you dry it out, then it's just the texture's not the same. But you can see this, this white part, it just stays really, really moist from that fat in the salmon. And this, Skin's nice and crunchy still. You know, you can cut it with a knife or a fork. You know, that piece is a little more cooked because it was a little bit thinner. But, you know, medium rare is kind of where you want it. That's why this one, you know, especially if you're doing a lot, this is a really nice, easy way to do it. And you can cook the whole filet like that. I wouldn't do this for a large amount of people, you know. If I was cooking it with the skin on, um, all at once, I probably wouldn't do more than eight or ten pieces because it's hard to kind of get them all cooked and held down. Um, we had a great question about the uh, smoke pieces. Uh, do they stay raw inside or do they continue to cook as you pull it off? I think people, you know, some people aren't always ready for a little bit of raw inside there. So, smoke? Does it stay raw inside? Or? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, you can, on this one, this hot smoke. We're just cooking it to medium rare. Um, when you're cold smoking it, you probably already cured it a little bit overnight, at least, uh, with salt and sugar. And you know, like if you eat grab uh, or a, a lox fish, that's just a cured fish. So that's been cooked through um, basically drying it out, preserving it with salt. Um, 
So I don't know. It's I guess it's raw, but it's cooked somehow. So um, this is cooked by salt. So it's preserved more than cooked in that state. Um, so if you were cold smoking it, you're not really you, smoke actually helps preserve things as well. But you're not cooking it to a temperature. Um, you're curing it with salt and then adding smoke to preserve it. So it's more of a preserving method than a cooking method. Uh, two more questions, and, and these are pretty really good ones, actually. Uh, one question is, how important is the verju in the green goddess dressing? And, uh, you know, maybe you might want to speak on verju for a second because we use it quite a bit in a number of our, in a number of our, our uh, recipes. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to make or break the dish, but I think it's a nice acid. You could add lemon juice or more lemon juice. Um, or you could add maybe cider vinegar. Uh, you could do, to, to kind of replicate the verju, you could take like uh, half vinegar, or maybe actually like a third vinegar and two thirds grape juice, maybe if you can't find it at home. But you can buy a lot of it online and like, you know, even in California, like Safeway, you know, a lot of the grocery stores stock verju now. Uh, it's becoming more common. But it's, a, it's just a less harsh acid, so it's a little bit rounder texture. So it's really nice um, with the Chardonnay because you're adding great flavor, but without quite as much acid. And for, for everyone that's tuned in, we do have a website called yourwinestore.com, and the verju that Justin's using is available on that. And we had one more great question. Looking back at when you were butchering the uh, salmon, uh, the question was, how do you remove the collar for cooking? But that's a lot of fish and a lot of flesh that's up there near the head. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of that part? Yeah, you, a pair of scissors would probably, maybe some poultry shears would be, you just kind of clip the bottom here and then cut through the top. Can you see that? Uh, kind of. So you would just want to come through with some scissors and clip the bottom right there. And just take your knife and just cut straight through on the top and then you're getting all that nice meat inside here um, so you know um, when you get a sushi restaurant you can get the hamachi collar which is a, a bigger fish uh, but a lot of times they'll marinate that and broil it um, with kind of like some sweet caramelizing you know mirin and things like that um, but the tuna collar is really good um, salmon collar is good you might want to Again, salt it and smoke it or grill it. But again, you don't want to dry it out, um, but it's pretty easy. Just want it to be like one clip there and one cut there. So we had another great question and it kind of leads me to thinking about some of these salmon preparations and the wines that would go with them. You know, within Jackson family, we're very well known for different Chardonnays that we make. Uh, and Justin, could you maybe relate maybe the Vintners Reserve or the Grand Reserve or maybe the Sable Ridge that you have in front of you to a couple of these dishes and maybe the what's and why's. And I'm going to leave it to you because your picture shows up on camera when you're talking more than me. So... Yeah, so uh, I mean, with the Sable Ridge, it's a really rich round Chardonnay. Uh, so it's nice with the fatty salmon and it's a pretty big Chardonnay. So even when we put a light amount of smoke on it, it's, it doesn't overpower the wines. Um, you know, pretty much any full body Chardonnay is gonna hold up well with this fish. You might, you know, you could do a Sauvignon Blanc or something higher acid, um, but then when you're with the Chardonnay, you're kind of matching texture. You know, the salmon's rich, the Chardonnay's rich. If you were trying to cut that and go the other direction, do a Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Gris. But I personally like a Chardonnay. Unless I'm going to the grill, uh, then maybe I'll do some Pinot if I'm getting some good caramelization and smoke on the grill. Also, it depends a lot on the sauce. You know, a lot of times people would do a Verblanc sauce or a rich buttery sauce. And definitely you want to get Chardonnay then. Um, you know, you can do a red wine sauce or, you know, something, even sometimes some meat sauces, uh, some beef based sauces can go with fish as well. And then you can get into more heavy body Pinot Noir. Um, so it's a pretty versatile fish and you know, there's a lot of different ways you can cook it. And I think uh, a lot of different wines, but I would say Chardonnay is my go-to uh, for anything outside of uh, uh, a high heat. 
So, and, it, and you touched on it really quick, and I think, you know, salmon is a powerful fish. Uh, I think Pinot Noir of lightweight to heavyweight, well, heavyweight can definitely work with Pinot Noir, everything from Oregon down to Santa Barbara within our portfolio. And then also maybe lighter weight Grenaches or wines that don't have a heavy duty tannin on them as well can work with Pinot. Can you touch a little bit on that, please, Justin? Yeah, I probably wouldn't go into big tannic wines, but um, yeah, you could definitely do some lighter fruit wines, uh, um, you know, Grenache, or, uh, you know, you could even probably do a rosé this time of year, too. Um, and that would be nice with the cold smoked salmon, too. Um, sometimes if I'm having a rich bagel, you know, and I'm adding capers and acid, you know, and it's hot outside, sometimes we'll do, uh, you know, a little bit crisper uh, white wine as well. Um, but again, like texturally, the green goddess is pretty rich from the uh, mayo and yogurt or sour cream that you want to put in there. Um, so again, texturally, Chardonnay, rich, creamy dressing. Uh, the nice thing about this one, it's pretty thick. You could definitely thin it out if you're going to put it on top. But this dressing's great if you're dipping into it because it's, um, you know, it's thick enough that it's going to stick to your vegetables, which is nice. So a lot of times we'll do it for uh, peppers vegetable crudite um, and you know it'll stay this green color for about two days um, and it's uh it's just really versatile you can smear it on a sandwich or toss it on salad it's nice with romaine in place of caesar uh, it's, it's kind of similar to caesar other than it doesn't have the cheese but it has that background flavor and texture it has that nice anchovy flavor but it's really really fresh herb forward put fennel tops in there. Um, you can kind of mix it up. It's, it's kind of a good starting place and you can kind of throw whatever you have that's green in there and fresh. Is it kind of like guacamole where if you weren't able to use it right away, if you put a little lemon juice on the top of that, would it help it from browning or is it, uh, is that just an age factor? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, after about two days, it's going to, it's going to turn. Um, it'll oxidize. You could put plastic wrap right down on it. Um, yeah, but, uh, you know, for two days, it's nice and green. So and this recipe doesn't make that much. So, you know, you should be able to get through that in a couple of days if you're doing you know, a few different things with it. Be we have another like, great question. You know, oh, we had... We had one more great question. Uh, in an effort to try to use everything that's coming off that fish, would you fry up some of that skin potentially or other uses of anything else that you might have there? Yeah, you know, not much goes to waste, um, you know, uh, other than the bones. And you could definitely take the cheeks out. You could make a stock with it. It's a pretty fatty fish. Um, it's definitely a distinct flavor. Um, we don't use stock with it here, but we have some cooks who like to take it home. Um, we have one of our chefs, Katie, the other day to call the bones home and she made a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a tea for her garden. So she's basically putting a bucket up with a bunch of stuff and letting it sit in her backyard. And then she's gonna pour that into her soil in her garden to help amend her soil. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure her neighbors are loving her right now. Um, but yeah, they, you know, there's not too much that goes to waste on the fish, and it just depends on, you know, that flavor profile. Usually when we're making a lot of stocks and things from the bones, um, we're using less fatty white fish. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're into the flavor, you could definitely do it. Um, the skin, you can uh, steam it and then fry it and make salmon crackers. There's definitely some pretty cool recipes online for that. Um, the main thing there is that you want to scrape all the meat off the skin and then you want to dry it out a little bit and then drop it in a fryer and it puffs up almost like a rice cracker, which is pretty cool. And then people will serve hors d'oeuvres on that. If I'm making a nice dinner for a small amount of people, I actually like to keep the skin on it and cook it. Um, but yeah, it just depends on you know, what, what, you're, what you're into and what you want to try. So. And these styles of preparation that you did today, are there other fishes that you could suggest that would easily, you know, jump in play with what these are and, and the styles of cooking that you did? Is this pretty universal or are there some stay away froms and some go tos? Yeah, I mean, the thinner, less fatty fish aren't quite as forgiving uh, with the cooking methods. Um, 
So, you know, the nice thing about the salmon cooking it in the oven like that uh, keeps it really moist. But if you had a fish with less fat, you know, it could, it could dry out pretty quickly. And with smoking, salmon's definitely, you know, one of the better ones. Obviously, smoked trout's pretty good. Um, you know, sturgeon, some hardier fishes for smoking. The lighter fish sometimes get overpowered by the smoke and dry out. Um, tuna, you could do obviously in the raw preparations, and I personally like tuna um, raw or seared quickly, uh, high heat and, and cooked rare. But yeah, I mean, fattier fish definitely for us, especially when we're doing bigger parties um, where we're serving lots of people, we'd go with a, a salmon um, or a, a richer, hardier fish if we're going to serve it hot. Um, because it's a little more forgiving when you have to cook and hold it. Nice. Does anybody out there have any other questions? I mean, we have a good uh, about 30 people online that have joined us and been watching. I'd love to, I'd like to thank Janet Perry for a number of great questions she's had this afternoon for sure. Um, so one thing I was going to mention next week, we got Buttercup. Is Buttercup going first? Buttercup's making a cookie next week. Vanilla strawberry stuffed shortbread cookie. So he, I think he's going to make a strawberry jam and make a little layer cookie, which will be fun. I think he's serving that with our reasoning. And then the next week, I was thinking about doing duck and wanted to see, you know, if people had any opinion on duck um, and learning how to cook it. We, uh, we're putting it on the menu starting tomorrow. Uh, there's a local company called Liberty Farms Poultry out of Petaluma, and they make some beautiful duck. So we're going to do some duck and pinot on the menu down here and so i thought if people were interested maybe we'd, we'd do a duck cooking class i could show you how to butcher a duck and the cool thing about these folks right now because uh, all the restaurants haven't opened up normally you can't buy this duck but they're actually shipping to people's homes right now so if anybody was interested in learning how to cook some duck we could do that on the 24th trace on the 24th of this month. Uh, so we're basically going to try and keep this up every Wednesday as long as we got some people that are interested. Um, but I think duck and peanut might be a fun one. We are also doing that for our farm to table August, the first Saturday in August. Do you know the date? Um, we have uh, Liberty Farms coming out. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's the second Saturday. Um, August 8th, we have a duck and peaches. So we're doing dry creek peaches and ducks. And normally we'd be setting one long table in the garden, but this year we're going to mix it up and basically make a little private table throughout the garden um, and spread it out. So we are going to do that. That'll be our first, uh, first farm to table dinner of the year. And I believe tickets will go on sale on KJ.com, but that should be a pretty pretty cool one i don't know how many seats we're going to be able to do um so it might sell out pretty quick but it's one of my favorite ones of the year and jim actually dry ages the duck for 30 days for it so as you would hang a steak and dry age a steak he dry ages the duck and, and a lot of the moisture comes out of skin and when you cook it it gets extra crispy and delicious and peaches are my favorite fruit and we'll have gale and uh, her husband out here from Dry Creek Beaches, and they'll join us for dinner that evening. And then um, Jim will come out probably with his daughter and her husband, and they'll be here to enjoy some duck and talk about duck with us. So, so Justin, we've already had some uh, responses about duck confit, yes to the duck, uh, different places to uh, – different people who are already really excited about it. Uh, and they're wondering if we, there's an address that we can send to everyone to get the duck so they could be able to cook along with you. So maybe yeah. we could work with Diane Bono and get everyone that address or? Yeah, we'll do that. So we'll get you a recipe. We'll get a recipe out and send it out. And then we'll get a contact for Liberty Poultry and they'll, uh, they'll ship it. And obviously they'll have to ship it overnight. So um, we can figure out how to do that. I'll work with Jim on that. And then we'll get Jim on the phone and he can talk duck stuff with us next time. And then thanks to Bob for being here today and answering some semen questions. That was cool. 
All right. Well, you got everyone saying, please send that soon. Let, let us know about it there. Everyone, there's been several responses. So, uh, and people saying how much they love the Liberty Farms as well. Uh, one quick question back. Do you think sea bass would work in the same preparations with the salmon? Um, I probably wouldn't smoke the sea bass. I would probably, uh, I would probably sear it and then maybe finish it in the oven. Um, you probably could slow roast it in the oven like that. But with the sea bass, I like to get a little, a little sear and a little car caramelization on it. And then that's one of the fish that is good to base with a little butter and then finish in the oven. If you if the thicker piece, you can finish it in the oven. Um, a lot of times I'll actually, uh, I've been cooking sea bass for a long time, but um, you can flour it and then dip it in a little egg and then put a little panko or breadcrumbs and then cook one side like that, flip it over and then throw it in the oven. Um, that's nice and finish it with a little butter sauce. But yeah, I probably wouldn't, it's, 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 it has a good amount of fat, but it's a pretty delicate flavor. So I think the smoke might overpower it a little bit. I think that's the nice thing about salmon. It's got a pretty distinct, strong flavor. So when you add that smoke to it, 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 it's really nice. And you know, some of the other fish just come across as smoky. Nice. Uh, everyone's very, very happy with everything and everything looks tremendous, Justin. It looks really, really tasty. How's that Sable Ridge tasting? Uh, it's tasting really good, yeah. This is a new wine for us and, you know, we, uh, we've been open for probably around a month now and this has been on the menu with the smoked salmon, um, preserved my lemon, sour cream, and the tortilla, which is the Spanish egg and potato dish. And then we just do a really fresh herb salad from the garden and a touch of lemon juice. And it's, uh, it's really nice, especially the last few days. It's been warm out here in Sonoma. So, you know, we serve the salmon warm and it's just uh, kind of a room temperature dish. So it's really, really nice. So if you're around and you want to try it, it's going to be on the menu for another week or so. Um, and if you want to try some duck and you're around, uh, we should have the duck on the menu by Friday. And then Buttercup's got a new cherry dessert coming on the menu, uh, which is delicious. We're actually going to do a, a Cabernet to pair with this dessert. Um, we're sold out of our dessert wines right now, and I don't think we get a new dessert wine until August. So we, uh, we challenged Buttercup to make us a really cool chocolate dish to go with uh, Cabernet. Uh, I think he ended up with Trace Ridge Cab, and he's got this chocolate and cherry dish where he poaches the cherries in the Cabernet and then makes a sauce with that. And then he bakes like a, a chocolate crust and then fills it with uh, a chocolate, almost like kind of like kind of like a brownie almost, um, but a little more chocolatey. And then he bakes cherries in the tart as well. And then he's got some candied hazelnuts and a little bit of really nice crunchy salt on there. And it's, absolutely delicious we might have to do a lesson just in different salts and when you use them because the finishing salts and the different things right now that we've been referring to are uh they're all little secret little like weapons that you guys have and uh i don't think everyone has access to them so maybe next time we could talk a bit about those yeah we can show you some salts i mean the, the main ones we use for most seasoning we use kosher salt for our recipes so we can be consistent um, and I would say that's the most common salt used in most kitchens. But then we have some nice sea salts. And a lot of us, when we travel, we bring back some fun salts with us. Um, but the other one we use for texture is called Malvin sea salt. And that one's from Essex, England. And it's a really light, flaky salt. Um, I like salt gris, the French, like really crunchy salt. Uh, that's my favorite for like, um, if you were doing a salmon crudo, or carpaccio or beef carpaccio, like adding that really coarse texture to it. Um, the one place I don't like to use really crunchy salts is with scallops because and, and shellfish, because I feel like sometimes people eat it and then they think it's a piece of the shell. So we stay away from uh, crunchy salts with shellfish. But other than that, uh, we use a lot of them for finishing right before the dish goes out, the vegetable or the meat, we sprinkle it on top. And a lot of times when you get a nice restaurant and you get this pop of texture and, and flavor, that's because the chef finished it with a little bit of salt. So kind of kind of fun, good, you 
your secret thing to have in your pantry to kind of step it up a notch. The main things that chefs do is you know add you know good olive oil, um, salt, and acid, and kind of play around with the balance of those things that really kind of make the dish pop. Well, I don't see too many more questions. Uh, I, you know, come up with some comments. Um, chili salt on chocolates is always a great little fun thing to have and kind of pops things a little bit. Oh, Justin, oh, there we are, you're back. Uh, but if there's no more questions, it's about a little after five o'clock, we can start winding this down and let everyone start enjoying what they might have been cooking along with Justin and uh, finish up that bottle of Chardonnay, maybe open up another one or have a little Pinot with their dish and venture out a little bit further. Uh, again, you know, these wines are available on your wine store and also through uh, the wine club and also that Verju is available through the wine club and also through or through your wine store. We'll get you information soon about the duck and what we'll be doing with that. So do stay tuned for more info about that one. And then farm to table, you'll probably see that up there pretty soon. So hopefully uh, we'll see some of you out here for a wine and food pairing or we'll see you in the garden and August and um, you know I think the tasting room reopens on the 22nd in Sonoma County we can start opening back up and so we'll definitely be doing some garden tours and it's absolutely beautiful out there. Today we went and walked around the garden and um, looked for some stuff for the new menu and it's gorgeous out there the flowers are blooming the, the, the bees are doing their job and um, it's a great time to come here and have a glass of wine and walk around to so come see us. All right. Thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll see you guys next week uh, with chef buttercup. Chef All right. Buttercup. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>